Hi, my name is Dr. Ashok Mahotra. I'm the chair of the Yoga and Meditation Society at SUNY Uniyanta. Uh, today we have a wonderful guest from University of Hawaii, Dr. Tamara uh, Albertini, who is a professor of philosophy, and she knows the Arabic language. And she's going to talk to us <laughs> about uh, uh, Islam and mysticism, Islam and contemplative practice, and some of the basic issues involved in Islam itself. Most probably, we'll delve into some of the history of Islam and some of the basic principles of Islam. And I'm very happy that you're with us. And I'm so glad that you have brought with us, uh, brought with you, this wonderful thing called the Loha Spirit. We also have uh, Dr. Schroeder here, who is the chairman of the philosophy department. And Dr. Schroeder is also the distinguished teaching professor. Among three of us, we'll be having a good time asking some questions about Islam. Islam has been talked about a great deal during the past now, 10 to 15 years. But most of the people do not have a proper understanding of Islam. And that's why I think we'll ask you a basic question. Tell us uh, about uh, what are the basic principles of Islam, or what is the book they use, and what are uh, the different aspects of Islam which people know in the West, but not uh, in depth, but only in a superficial way. Right. You know, what's really very attractive about Islam, and which also may explain its incredible success, you know, most people know that Islam was able to spread within 80 years from the Arabian Peninsula to Spain in the West and India in the East. It's a very, mm -hmm. very short time. And so how do you explain that unless you just think of military conquest? But see, military conquest doesn't give you conversion. Right? Mm -hmm. So I think it's um, the simplicity of the formula that was attractive. And that is also at times misleading. Let me first tell you something about the simplicity. The five pillars, right? right. What if are anything, the five pillars, yes. If, any, if people associate anything with Islam, yeah. it's the five pillars. So it's, it's the creed called Shahada. You know, you say there is no God but God, uh, and Muhammad is his messenger. Okay. By virtue yeah. of saying that uh, you become a Muslim, so as I have said that now, right. um, a, very, a, a very devout Muslim will tell me you have just become one, right? So it's that simple. That simple. Okay. It's even the minimal requirement. You may not abide by the... Uh, other four pillars. But as long as that first one is meaningful to you, you still right. qualify as a Muslim. Mm -hmm. Five daily prayers, the second pillar. Mm -hmm. the, uh, the, uh, the fast, the Ramadan, entire month to, uh, you know, to abide by. Almsgiving, the fourth pillar, and the <coughs> pilgrimage called the Hajj. If you can afford it, and if you are, you have, you know, that, you know, the health to, to, to go through that very arduous um, travel and so forth. Right. So five right. pillars. Yeah. Now, what is, it's simple, right? It looks like you do that and you accomplish yourself as a religious person. But that's also misleading. So it usually takes an already established family tradition of spirituality for a Muslim to know that what really makes it to be an accomplished religious per person is to go beyond the five pillars. And to my understanding, that's where Islam really becomes interesting. So, all right, you do the five pillars, it's the, the necessary prerequisite but that's not really the spiritual life of Islam yet. Okay, so that's the formal structure, you know, five pillars. That's for memorization, that's to guide people. Right. That these five things are expected. But then you said that the real aspect of Islam is spirituality. Could you delve into that and tell us what that might be like and how that could be compared with Christianity or Judaism or Hinduism or any other tradition? Right. Um, there is the spirituality that has to do with your personal relationship with God. And then there is a spirituality that has to do with the practical actions. And the combination of the two is really what makes you the accomplished religious person in Islam. Uh, for people who have the established spiritual tradition in their families, or for people who read very carefully scripture, what they realize at some point is that it's the things that are not required of you that really make you a good Muslim. Uh, how do they do that? How do they discover that Islam has another very simple formula? Uh, human acts are divided into five categories. The okay. things that are mandatory, five pillars of Islam. The things um, that are recommended. Islam does not insist, but says, well, you may want to think about other things, 
okay. that are good for yeah. you and for the community. So mm -hmm. recommend it. The things <coughs> that are neutral, they're yeah. neither forbidden um, nor, nor mandatory. Islam basically tells you, think about it. Right? Think about it. Okay. The fourth category has to do with things that are discouraged. It's not really forbidden to you, but discouraged. So it's, you, you get a measure there from the religion telling you, well, if you can't, don't do it. And then the things that are clearly forbidden. Okay. Now, the, the good Muslim, the good yeah. Muslim will strengthen the second category. And they, what will that be? The recommended act. Okay, what will those be? Um, anything that goes beyond what is, uh, you know, strictly required of you. Compassion, health. Uh, sacrifices, anything where you can say, well, I can live without prestige, I can live without additional honor, I can live without more wealth, all of that makes you to be uh, the perfect devout before God. Okay. You speak of being devout before God, and I'm told that the, the term Islam means to surrender, and that a, a Muslim is one who has surrendered. Could, mm. you, could you address that concept of of what that surrender is like, because I certainly know that a lot of my students feel as though they would have to be surrendering their individuality or something that, that they think of as their own personality and worth and so on. Uh, and so Islam does not seem attractive to them for that very reason. Um, I argue that it's a misunderstanding on their part, but it would I be helpful to hear from you. I perfectly agree with you. So submission is not something that has to do with surrendering one's individuality. Sub submission um, has to do with this um, offer that Islam makes to its followers, which has all to do with saying you may be confident. You are not alone. So you submit to the will of God, meaning you see yourself in a larger context, larger uh, context in terms of society, larger context in terms of what is your past and mm -hmm. what is your future. And it's, it's meant to, give, to, give, to empower people, to make them feel more at ease. They, they're not supposed to feel that they're alone. They're not supposed to think uh, to be assaulted by anxieties, questions, that. That's really the original meaning of submission. Mm -hmm. But I must say that even Muslims tend to misunderstand that, and they may sometimes think of submission as passivity. So you don't do anything. You just wait for God to act in your behalf. But that's not the meaning of Islam. Uh, there is Allah, so the name of God in Islam. Allah does not expect uh, the followers of Islam um, not to do anything on their own, not to show initiative. Qu quite the opposite. Quite the opposite. Um, I think uh, lots of people really do not know much about Islam. So could you say something about you know Prophet Muhammad, who is considered to be the one who uh, is the original person who started Islam? Right. Also the book which was revealed to him, and what is that uh, like? And how big is it? Mm -hmm. How many surahs are there? How many right. sections are there? And uh, how do people actually read it? And they think that uh, just by reading it in the proper way, you are able to uh, get that kind of contemplative practice or it's a kind of meditation. A lot of questions yeah, back in there. So I'll try to my best to be as brief as I can. Yes. The time uh, the Prophet Muhammad uh, lived in the sixth, uh, was born in the sixth century, died in, uh, in the seventh century. Uh, we know that he came from a very prestigious um, Meccan family. Um, he was an orphan, so that marginalized him to a certain extent. It's very bad for you in an Arabian society. If you don't have your parents, you're a weaker link. Mm -hmm. His uncle takes care of him. Um, People apparently had much appreciation for him when he was a young man. Uh, piety, devotion, integrity, all of that was said of him. Marries at the age of 25, a much older woman. Her right. name was Khadija. Okay. Khadija becomes the first believer of Islam. She has an incredibly important position in the Islamic world okay. still today. Um, nothing seems to indicate that he will be a prophet, let alone a founder uh, of a new religion. Um, the story goes that he loved to meditate in a cave outside Mecca. And one day, an angel appears to him. It turns out it's the archangel Gabriel, who is also known to Christians. Gabriel speaks to him um, and, and recites the first verses of what then will become the Quran, Islam's holy scripture. Prophet is uh, struck with fear, runs home, goes to his wife Khadija and begs her to cover his head. So that's really the beginning of Islam. Until he understands that uh, 
the angel is um, a legitimate power, so no demon, no e- nothing evil about the angel. He goes back to the cave, receives more revelation. The terminology in Islam is that the verses of the Quran uh, come down uh, upon the Prophet. They descend upon the Prophet. And that's yeah. now really the, what is at the heart of the religion. The Quran is not just any scripture, the way the Torah is the holy scripture for the Jews, the way the gospel um, are scripture for the, for the Christians. It is literally the word, the word of, of God. God. Okay. And that makes communication sometimes very difficult between Muslims and non-Muslims. The Quran is not seen as a text. Right. So uh, the kind of hermeneutics that other religions have developed in, to understand their holy scripture may not be applied to the Quran. And, well, very often uh, it was applied, and it is still being applied, but one has to be very, very careful about how to legitimate that approach. Um, Not one uh, word may be changed. Um, Muslims are encouraged to memorize the entire Quran. There is a special title that you receive if you do. You become a hafiz if you memorize the entire Quran. And, of course, memorizing means really word by word, word by word, uh, I was, as I was growing up as a child in, in Tunisia, I had to memorize the Quran as well, bits by bits by bits. And I remember the terror that we all had, in other words, all children in that class. And if we forgot one word or substituted it with a synonym, which easily happens, right? Uh, the teacher was very upset with us because it really meant you changed the word mm-hmm. of God. Right? Okay. So Arabic, Quran came down in Arabic, yeah. is a sacred language. Mm-hmm. Now, the Quran, for those who you know, are able to read it in the original, uh, is also beautiful, uh, has a beautiful language, it's very, very appealing. Poetry. Is it poetic? It yeah. is it's po- singable. It, yeah, <laughs> it is course. singable, yes. Right. And right. And people That's do what people it. like to know. Right? Yeah. yeah. Um, it's, its beauty was pro- uh, probably one of the most powerful arguments of the new religion. Because the Prophet Muhammad would say, well, a human being cannot produce anything like it, right? right? Whereas the people of Mecca, his native city, were, were actually telling him, you know, Muhammad, if you want to tell us you're a poet, we're with you. Yeah. But don't suggest to us that this comes from God. So there were you know, right. incredible yeah. frictions there in yeah. the beginning. And he would always say, well, if you think that a human being can produce anything of, the, of a comparable beauty, then produce it. Okay. Well, let's, 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 let's put you on the spot. We won't ask that you sound like the uh, archangel Gabriel, but you must surely have some favorite passages, <laughs> and if you will, to, to give our viewers a, a sense of <laughs> the sound right. of, of, yeah, of the uh, Quran in, uh, uh, in the Arabic. I wish yeah. I could have prepared for this, because I did memorize <laughs> the Quran, or parts of it, when I was a child, but there is one surah where I can try. So the, the, na- the chapters of the Quran are called uh, surahs in Arabic. This is one of the later surahs. Later does not mean later in chronology, but um, just later in terms of the size. So the Quran starts with the longest uh, surahs and ends up with the shortest one. So that was the <coughs> logic of life. So towards the end of the Quran, there is a uh, shorter surah uh, called the earthquake. And the idea is that the earthquake will announce the last day of judgment. And I'll, maybe I'll, I'll remember a few parts of this. And just pay attention to the rhythm, and you will understand it must have to do something with an earthquake. إِذَا زُلْزِدَ الْأَرْضَ زَلْزَالَهَا وَقَالَ الْإِنسَانُ مَا لَهَا يَوْمَئِذًا And so forth, right? إِذَا زُلْزِدَ الْأَرْضَ زَلْزَالَهَا There is a rhythm there, right? right? That's supposed to, to right. strengthen the, the, you know, yeah. the, the content. Uh, so that gives you a thing to say. Right, right. <laughs> what, what wonderful. I That's think it's, it's wonderful, you, you know, can say it because people don't know how it really sounds. Because I remember, you know, when I take students to India, we go to the Red Fort in Delhi. Mm-hmm. And Red Fort was created by uh, Shah Jahan, who also got the uh, Taj Mahal built. Oh. And there is a place called uh, Diwane Khas. And Diwane Khas is where the king met with uh, uh, royalty. And there is Diwane Am where he met with ordinary people. And the Diwane Khas, in Persian, they have some... Uh, poems written there, mm-hmm. and one of them sounds like this, and I'll also produce that Persian sound. It says, Gar bar wai zami as, kime as, 
Himeas, Himeas. And it, it starts like this. Garfardosh, Barroai, Zemias, Himeas, Himeas, Himeas. Barfardosh means if there is heaven on this earth, this is, this is, this is. Ah. And that's where Charyam sat, who was actually a Sunni Muslim, mm -hmm. and who sat there on his pickup throne with Kohenu diamond in the back, mm -hmm. and he looked at this verse, and he said, if there is a heaven on this earth, this is. This, this is, is it. <laughs> yeah. So tell us something about uh, uh, how Islam, which started as a religion with Prophet Muhammad came to be divided into three different parts, and or some people call it schism or mm -hmm. schism, mm -hmm. in the division between Shiite and Sunni. And then later on, another aspect of Islam developed into Sufi. So, first, let us uh, know mm -hmm. about those two aspects. Right. There was actually just one schism, one division that has to do with the events that followed the assassination of the fourth caliph. When Muhammad died, there was a problem of succession. Uh, the Islamic community back then felt that they should really go in a very democratic way about it, and they should elect who is worthy enough to succeed Muhammad in leading the community. Uh, the father of one of his favorite wife, Aisha, became the first caliph, Abu Bakr, na na na. Second, third, fourth caliph was the prophet's cousin and son-in-law, married to his daughter, Fatima. Um, he was considered a legitimate caliph by all Muslims back then and still today. He was challenged by the governor of Syria called Muawiyah. Uh, the governor of Syria uh, won the battle. Uh, Ali got killed. Yeah. And Muawiyah created Islam's first hereditary dynasty. And that's when the schism started. Nobody knew back then uh -huh. that there will be mm. a group of Muslims that will remain distinct for all ages, I suppose. Uh, back then, it looked more like a political issue. Um, that's the beginning of the Shia. Shia just means party. So the party of Ali you know, separated off mainstream um, Islam, and they claimed that you have to be from the bloodline of the Prophet to be the spiritual uh, leader of the community. And saying that, I'm also suggesting that for Shiites, um, there is a necessity of there being a spiritual leader. Sunnis, Sunnis learned in their history that there is politics and there is religion. The ruler is, of course, never really entirely a secular ruler. Of course, he's the ruler of Muslim. The ruler is the guardian of the religion. But he does not have to be a theologian. He does not have to be a scholar. It's understood he is in charge of political affairs, of warfare, and things like that. Whereas uh, the Shiites always insisted on their leader to be a scholar. You look at the scene today in Iran, and I think you get a sense of why it is that it is the scholars who are politically in charge of the country, because that's really at the heart of the Shia doctrine. Okay. Uh, now, in India, you know, we had a kind of schism that took place in Buddhism. So two schools of Buddhism came into existence, <laughs> Hinayana, which is uh, the school of the elders. They're mm -hmm. called Theravada also. Another is the Mahayana, the big miracle. Mm -hmm. Now, the difference between them, of course, there are many differences, but th there was a theological difference. The school of the elders, Hinayana, believed that uh, they actually had the original teachings of the Buddha, right. and uh, they knew the scriptures. But whatever Buddha said, they kept that or preserved it uh, orally. Where the Mahayana took some of those, and as they moved to other parts of the world, there's some other change these around, depending on the country. Even the, uh, the statue of the Buddha uh, mm -hmm. looked like a Chinese or a Nepalese and so forth. Mm -hmm. So the differences were the original teaching. So is there a similar kind of thing in Shiite and the Sunni groups? Right. They say that they really know the Quran. Mm -hmm. You do not know the Quran, or you are misinterpreting the Quran. I think that is the point of comparison. Yeah. Um, Shiites are deeply convinced that the Prophet Muhammad had imparted special knowledge upon Ali, his son-in-law. The understanding is that Ali was told the exegesis of some very obscure passages in the Quran that the rest of the community did <coughs> not know about. And that, of course, gives more weight to this idea of the bloodline of the Prophet being important. Why? Because there is a spiritual uh, message 
right. that can only be imparted upon those who are descendants of, of the Prophet. So that, that really works very well as a comparison right. with, and, and, with the Buddhist. And, and in Buddhism, they, they speak of a, a second turning of the wheel of Dharma and the, uh. the revealing of, of hidden truths that the world wasn't ready for initially and so on. But, but let's turn to Sufism for, for a few minutes. Um, when I think of, of Sufism, I, th I think of a, a focus on um, the aesthetics, a focus on mysticism, a focus on love. The notion of surrender becomes one uh, which is metaphorically expressed in terms of bride and bridegroom, lover and so on. And it's a, a union with God, that they, or Allah, that they seem to be seeking. Uh, and and that is, that's a very, very different sort of distinction than the political one that we're talking about here, right? Right. You have all the right connotations. Everything that you mentioned is really part of the Sufi legacy. Now, it would be a misunderstanding to think that Sufism is a third sect in Islam. It is not. You can be a Sunni and a Sufi, or you can be a Shiite and a Sufi. Yeah, Su Sufism is probably the common link. Right? And maybe Sufism will be what will uh, bring the two communities um, closer together, hopefully, in the, in the near future. Um, how, what was the, what is the, what, you know, when did, when did it happen? When was Sufism born? Of course, nobody knows precisely. It's assumed that sometime in the 8th uh, century uh, that you had something like hermits. And sometimes people say, well, it must have been the influence of all the religions, maybe Christianity, maybe Zoroastrianism, maybe even Buddhism, right? Because so you have this ideal that is a very ascetic ideal. You withdraw from society. You live in a cave or up, up in the mountains. You see God and, and, and all the things that you associate with a lifestyle like that. Uh, we, we, we will never know precisely what the origins of Sufism are. But we do know that it, it did indeed start with um, single individuals who withdrew from society, which is not at all the case uh, in later Sufism, later Sufism meaning, uh, let's say, 10th, 11th century and up to this day, what you find it, uh, happening later on in Sufism is the, um, the existence of confraternity. And every confraternity, every brotherhood uh, yeah. will have its yeah. own path. So tariqa is the Arabic yeah. word. It just means, ta yeah. means path, path yeah. the yeah. way, right? Yeah, that's also the same word in Urdu. Mm -hmm. So the Arabic, yeah. the yeah. Arabic word, yeah. and um, some of them are very much centered around a master. Some others will have more emphasis on the individual uh, spiritual development. What's mm -hmm. common to all of them is understanding that it is not enough to just do the right action. It's not enough to just uh, follow the five pillars of Islam. Um, uh, a truly religious person uh, asks for more. And what that more is is really the union with God. Right, right. And and when yeah. let me follow just I, I, just I quickly with that, if I yeah. if I can. Go ahead. Yeah. That uh, that I think of the the lo the lovely poetry of Rumi, and uh, mm. um, particularly a, a poem where he hears the flute playing, and uh, he thinks of the reed that has been torn from its homeland right. and is, is crying to return. And in some ways, that is the central message of Islam, isn't it? That, that, we, that we come from Allah and, and that Allah will, will take us back, that, that we are valuable beings, that we are not tainted by original sin, and that we've, we've simply lost our way. We've, we've been torn from the reed bed um, and, and that we need to return and that we can do so. That's actually <laughs> a wonderful thing you said, because it reminded me of, uh, you know, Sufi, or Sufism in India, because it was very popular during the 13th and 14th centuries, because at that point, Islam had a great deal of influence in India. Now, most of the people, you know, think about Islam, only the Middle East, but there are more than one billion people on this earth who are Muslims or believe in Islam, and the majority of them are in Asia, that Indonesia is the biggest, mm -hmm. the largest Muslim country, close to 200 million. India is the second largest, under 40 million. Pakistan, 130 million. Bangladesh, 120 million. So almost most of them are zeroing in there. But India had a special brand of Sufism, which was actually uh, understood and uh, some of them modified by some of the Indian thinkers who were brought up in this special movement called the Bhakti movement. And Bhakti movement right. means the devotional movement that goes back to the time of Bhagavad Gita, where a devotee is devoted to Krishna, God Krishna, 
and you sing for Krishna, you chant the name of Krishna, you dance for Krishna, not only yourself, but in the company of other people, so that it's a wonderful blend, that through your body, through your heart, and through your voice, you become one with that. And there is a wonderful, actually, uh, Sufi saying in India, that we are all part of, we used to be part of that wonderful sun, which gives us light. But it so happened that when the sun started giving us light, each one of us is a ray of that sun. But we are some other distracted. We think we are different. Mm -hmm. We are wandering around to go back to that sun. And that's just like the reed, which is yeah, very much, very the much union, so. what they are looking for. The example from India is a very fine one because it shows the incredible openness of Sufism in Islam. Again, people hear about Islam today and they think of a very rigid religion. But in fact, once you look at Sufism, which is extremely present in the Islamic world, sometimes Sunni countries are uncomfortable with the presence of, Su of Sufism and will try to minimize its impact. But it is a reality. Um, what you find in Sufism is an openness for the customs and, pr and uh, religious practices of the place. So let's say right. Sufism moved into India. India. It was absolutely receptive to the yeah. ways in which people were living their religion before Sufism right. arrived there. And it would typically incorporate elements mm -hmm. that, that were you know, already in existence. Um, Sufism to me, and that's very interesting to realize, if you also think of a central term to Sufism, zikr, remembrance. Zikr, so you yeah. mentioned people yeah. coming together and coming doing together, the devotion together. together. The yeah. idea is that you, know, you, you use the, the, the rhythm. You know, they, ba they usually take the, the words of the shahada, the creed, you know, in Arabic, La ilaha wa illallah wa Muhammad Rasulullah. Mm -hmm. The beauty is that the, there is an H loud, you know, yeah. Allah. Allah. And then it, it allows <coughs> for, you know, a very good breathing. Right. So they, they use that. So it's a, it's a, mm -hmm. you know, has to do with the right breathing, the right chant, the right rhythmic. It's an acceleration that's mm -hmm. really pursued, at the end of which you empty yourself. And in that sense, you remember God because you make space for God. So there is that which is at the heart of Sufism, the zikr, the remembrance. The zikr, the remembrance, and the, the emptiness. And at the same time... Yes, just a few seconds left. At the same time, <laughs> what I think Sufism yeah. does is being the memory of the world. Because everywhere where Sufism goes, it remembers also the religious practice of the place. Of the place. I just wanted to mention that uh, as Sufism was practiced in India, uh, there was Guru Nanak who started a new religion called Sikhism. Mm -hmm. He took certain aspects of the Hindu devotional movement and certain aspects of Sufism and started a new religion which has now close to 20 million followers in the world. It's called Sikhism. Yes. And the yeah. present Prime Minister of India is a Sikh and who really blends you know, Islam with Hinduism and the best part of what we call mysticism. And he also has a doctorate degree in economics <laughs> so it's a wonderful blend. Interesting so combo. It's a good thank you. message for the future. <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs> thank this you for having me. Wonderful. Well, thank you. And wonderful. Thank you, Dr. Schrader. Yeah. Really.